Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Faye Rosenfeld, and I am the Vice President of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library. Tonight, I have the true honor of introducing two extremely distinguished guests, Professors Margaret Burnham and Saidia Hartman. They are here to discuss Margaret's newest book, by hands now known, Jim Crow's Legal Executioners. This book is a devastating account of case after case of black people murdered during the Jim Crow era and of a society so imbued with racism and violence that it not only permitted these atrocities to take place, but also to go unpunished, unrecorded, and virtually unknown to all but family members of the victims until now. Margaret Burnham is a renowned expert in civil and human rights, comparative constitutional law, and international criminal law, whose distinguished career includes serving as a lawyer with the NAACP and as a judge. In 1993, she was appointed by President Nelson Mandela to serve on what later became the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Since 2002, she's been a professor at Northeastern University School of Law, where she founded and directs the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Program, the preeminent academic center for the study of historical redress in the United States. In 2021, President Joe Biden appointed Professor Burnham to the Civil Rights Cold Case Records Review Board, which is, ch which is charged with reviewing the records of civil rights era cold criminal cases of murders and other racially motivated violence that occurred between 1940 and 1979. And there could not be a more perfect conversation partner to speak with Margaret about her book than the cultural and literary scholar Saidia Hartman. Saidia is a professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia and the author of many groundbreaking articles and books, including Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, which she worked on as a Cullman Center Fellow right here at the New York Public Library, and for which she received the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her book, Scenes of Subjection, Terror, Slavery, and Self-Making in the 19th, 19th Century America, has just been re-released in a special 25th anniversary edition. And she's the uh, recipient of numerous awards, including in 2019, the MacArthur Genius Award. We are so, so lucky to have Margaret and Saidia with us this evening. And I am going to get out of the way and bring them up on stage in just a minute. Uh, before doing that, I want to make sure everyone knows that you can purchase By Hands Now Known and Scenes of Subjection uh, from the library shop right here uh, in this room if you're attending the program in person and also online if you are attending virtually. Of course, if you live in New York, uh, you can also check out a copy of the book using your New York Public Library card. We have some incredible guests coming up in the next few weeks at Live. Stacey Schiff, Tim Gunn, who joins us twice in one week, Siddhartha Mukherjee, Andrew Solomon, Andrea Elliott, Beth Macy, mezzo-soprano Joyce DiDonato, who will be speaking and hopefully also singing uh, about her new role portraying Virginia Woolf in the Met's new production of The Hours. Uh, N.K. Jemison, who's going to join us virtually uh, to launch her new book in conversation with LeVar Burton, and so much more. So please visit nypl.org slash live for more information and to sign up. We are extremely grateful for the continuing generosity of Manaz Bahani Bartos, Adam Bartos, the late Celeste Bartos, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, and of course all of you, our wonderful friends near and far, who support the New York Public Library and help us bring all of this extraordinary programming to you wherever you are for free. Sadia and Margaret will speak for about 45 minutes and take questions. If you're in the room, uh, you'll see note cards on your chairs, and one of our wonderful staff members will come around and collect them. If you're watching remotely, you can just type your questions into the chat or send us an email at publicprograms at nypl.org, and they're going to get to as many questions as they can. Now, please welcome Margaret Burnham and Saidia Hartman. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello, studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here tonight with Margaret Burnham, 
discussing this really powerful and brilliant book. So I just want to kind of start at the beginning, and I want to ask you about the title of the book, because it seems that in the title you do two things. Um, one, you reconceptualize um, the way in which we understand racial violence, and I feel like the title is pushing against a common conception or framing of racialized violence, and it also speaks to the redressive or reparative work of the book. So why don't we start there? Thanks, thanks so much, Sadia. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the library back in my hometown, and really a great honor. I am such a fan of yours, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I couldn't think of a, uh, a, a better conversation partner to talk about the, the journey that resulted in this book. Uh, and as you suggest, the, the title obviously is a play on by hands not known, uh, which was the common phrase used by uh, prosecutors and judges and coroners uh, to uh, excuse the violence that was visited on African American communities in the South during the period that I'm talking about. Uh, and as well, so Jim Crow's legal execution as they were acting, you know, with badges and with robes and with all of the, you know, indicia of law uh, as they uh, performed these uh, invisibilizing acts with respect to the violence. And uh, I suggest as well that um, it's time for us to appreciate uh, who was behind all this uh, and not just the individuals, but as well the structures, the cultural structures and institutions, uh, legal structures that uh, made all of this possible. Yeah, um, and um, in the introduction, you make um, a number of provocative theoretical assertions, and I, um, being the nerd I am, I actually wrote them all out, but this is not a classroom, so I will not read um, those major points, but I, but I do, you know, um, want you to address a few things which, you know, related to the title, and one, um, you know, really critical point you make is about you know, the enormity of violence, but it's totally quotidian character, right? So not only do we know who these, you know, violent actors are, but people are committing these, you know, gross and heinous acts, and they're totally, um, you know, public about them. There, there's no need to actually to hide um, in the wake of the enormous violence that is committed. So I guess I I want you to talk about why um, it is so important to underscore the quotidian violence that actually made um, you know segregation, which we kind of I, I hate the term Jim Crow because I'm always in the 19th century popular theater. It's such a light you know, yeah, little term. Is a better, is a stronger, yeah, right? it's a stronger it's word. Yeah. So even like how we name it seems inadequate to really um, illuminating that, you know, that enormity. But can you just say more about the quotidian character of that violence and how, um, you know, and how really just trying to elaborate that is important uh, in for us to even understand what this kind of racialized order was, how it operated. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, so the book really operates, I hope, uh, at two levels. Uh, I want to lift up and remember uh, those individuals who have uh, essentially disappeared from history, uh, been erased, intentionally erased from history and who were the victims, um, and I want to remember uh, their survivors, many of whom are still among us. Uh, but as well, I, I also want to situate their uh, individual stories uh, in a broader understanding of the federal and state and local uh, apparat apparatus that made all of this possible. Uh, and so I place the stories, the first chapter of the book is about rendition, it's about folks who fled the South to, uh, to um, 
to better to to sanctuary states essentially, uh, looking uh, looking for sunnier places, as it were, uh, <clears throat> and the ways in which uh, communities south and north collaborated uh, 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 in order to, uh, you know, African American communities south and north collaborated to make these escapes possible. And here I, uh, I argue that this is a, a, a direct uh, pathway from slavery through the rendition period um, not just the the very roads, but the legal um, the, the legal uh, skills that were applied to these cases uh, are really those um, that um, pick up where uh, abolitionists left off, and <clears throat> and so uh, I argue as well that the, the federal government here uh, had an outsized role that we don't really uh, that I think for the first time we are sort of. Uh, fully understanding that the cases give us an opportunity to illuminate the role of the federal government. And we think that, you know, there was the South and then there was the federal government, while in, in point of fact, um, the, the uh, federal government's failures uh, left open uh, space for the violence to uh, proceed uh, uh, w without being uh, in any way uh, in any way impeded by, uh, by federal law, federal authority, or the Constitution. Uh, and I, I argue as well in the book that, um, that we can look at some of the violence um, and uh, trace it quite literally back to slavery, and it helps us understand distortions in post-slavery law um, that relate to the um, slavery regime. And here I look specifically at the question of kidnapping and uh, by illustrating through a series of cases the ways in which African Americans were pulled out of their homes and places of work and uh, taken to dark places and essentially, as Emmett Till ended up dead, but many, many folks did not. They were beaten, left on the road. Uh, and kidnappers were, uh, were never prosecuted. So the crime of kidnapping essentially um, be, uh, is unenforceable. Uh, when the crime is a, a black on uh, white on black crime, and I argue here that this is really directly related to uh, an understanding of the uh, of uh, you know of the, the the reality that if white folk uh, uh, demanded that a black individual go with him or her, um, that that was you know that was an order that couldn't be uh, couldn't be refused, uh, couldn't be turned down. And here uh, I look as well at the Emmett Till case, for example, which is, you know, in addition to a murder, is also a kidnapping. And kidnapping in, in that case was never tried. And I say, uh, argue here that this, um, this, uh, this, this is a, a direct um, legacy of slave law. Yeah, I mean, I think that in reading it, I was really um, struck by that. I mean, many of your descriptions of life under Jim Crow um, could be descriptions of life under slavery in terms of vulnerability to violence, impeded movement, um, a society that is organized around maintaining and preserving this kind of white over black order. But um, in the rendition uh, section, which is the first section of the book, um, I, I want to ask you to tell two stories from that section because reading it, um, I was like, oh wait, am I reading about the 20th century or am I reading about the 18th century or the 19th century? And you do something really wonderful in that section where you're looking at, um, I think it's an 18th century case involving Anthony Burns and then you uh, think about that in, uh, in relationship to, is it Victoria um, Edwards? What is Viola Edwards. Viola yeah. Edwards, yeah. yeah. So maybe if you could just talk about those you know, two very different stories of rendition, which are also stories of fugitivity. Um, and that's why I was like, oh wait, is this slavery mm -hmm. or is this freedom? And just the, the, the same kinds of um, networks are resorted to, to basically um, elude the law and preserve black freedom. 
So yes. you, yeah. yeah, so <clears throat> the uh, Anthony Burns is a well-known case out of Massachusetts, Boston, actually. Uh, Burns was a escaped, uh, enslaved person escaped uh, and ended, ended up in, in Boston and uh, in, uh, in the 1860s, early 1860s, before the Civil uh, War, uh, he uh, is arrested, uh, taken before a commissioner under the fugitive, then fugitive, the then very strict Fugitive Slave Act, um, and sought to be returned to uh, to Virginia, returned south. He he would be, he would he would be returned first to Virginia and then sold south, uh, further south. And uh, the case generates enormous protest in Boston. The streets of Boston are lined uh, with thousands of people uh, seeking to prevent his rendition. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and th there's reference to this later on in many of the post-Civil uh, War era cases that w w where there's a discussion about um, the demands of the slave states uh, in the pre-Civil War period uh, and the ways in which demands for individuals seeking to escape from lynchings look very, very much like um, those of an earlier period and the sanctuary states here uh, are claiming um, that is it is their right, their right under sort of international human rights, although obviously we didn't speak about it in those terms at that, at that point, uh, but that they had um, the legal right to protect the safety uh, of the individual sought by the, by the southern states. Viola Edwards comes along in 1927. She escapes from, um, from uh, Florida, from Pensacola, Florida, um, really running a, a away from what she, with good reason, thought might be a lynch mob. Um, and again, she, it's the hiding, it's the, you know, it's the, it's the journey, it's the, it's the woods, the train, the bus. Um, so in that sense, it's, it is a latter-day underground railroad that we're dealing with. Um, and these people land in communities that, you know, where there's continuity uh, from the um, kinds of uh, uh, acts uh, and behaviors um, that allowed them to feel safe uh, in, um, in, in places like Detroit. And so this chapter really deals with three Detroit cases that I focus on Detroit because Detroit is a particularly active state in the, rendition, in the rendition period. And there are lawyers there who really build their whole legal careers around rendition. That's all they do. I describe one lawyer who's got 97 cases of rendition, people running from the South, ending up in Black Bottom, Detroit. And so it becomes a very sophisticated uh, form of uh, lawyering. You know, they've got to be fast-footed. They've got to understand the politics of the scene. They've got to understand their communities of resistance in Detroit. They've got to understand their relatives back in Georgia and Mississippi. Um, and it's a, just a really exciting, it, you know, it's as exciting as the stories that are so well known about um, the escapes from slavery. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's, um, they're just like many, many great stories in, um, in the book. And I, I don't know which of my two questions to ask you that, but I guess, you know, it is a book, um, in some ways it's a hard book to read because it is filled with, you know, cases of murder and atrocity. And I wanted to ask you, um, about the writing of it, like so what it meant to, as you're recovering um, all of these stories that are lost, as you're writing these unwritten pages, um, what was required to do that, and how was that process impacted by your discussions with the families of those who had okay, also great. So yeah. first of all, I didn't do this alone. I did this with my students and colleagues uh, at my law school and really across our university. Uh, and it took a long time. So we've been working on this project for about 15 years, collecting these cases. I also uh, had a, uh, an academic partnership and a close personal partnership with um, uh, Melissa, Melissa Nobles, Nobles yeah. a scholar, uh, political scientist at, um, at MIT. So we had a team that worked on this. Uh, and I think that w what was most astounding to me, and I think to all of us who, who, who were connected with the project, 
was, uh, and I consider myself pretty well versed in African American history. Um, it's never been done before. <laughs> These cases are out there. And they're, you know, the files are in Washington, D.C., and the letters are buried in the NAACP records at, in the Library of Congress. And the families are holding bits and pieces of memory. And no one's put this together mm -hmm. before. And, and, you know, there are other books about, lots of other books about Jim Crow. And maybe, you know, maybe people thought, there's nothing more to say. But for the families, I think it, it is critically important for them to have access to the official records of what transpired as far as their loved ones are concerned, and to know that there are other families like them all across the country. And um, so they were eager partners with us. Um, they shared, they had obviously all collected their own you know, documents, not so much, not FBI or DOJ records, but they had, you know, newspaper articles and um, stuffed in Bibles, that sort of thing, as we went around the country. Um, and, you know, we would go places and they'd, and they'd call their, 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 their other relatives in and we'd all sit around around the table and talk about what happened. And so it was um, enormously important for them and the book tries to put it all together and contextualize it, develop some theoretical um, questions and approaches to the material, and um, explain how, uh, how and why it all happened. And as you say, what its relationship is to past and present. And here, I think the discontinuities are as important as the continuities here. And, uh, and, and, and ought not to be sort of lost in recovering this history. I, don't, I think it's way too simple to say, ah, you know, slavery, Jim Crow, 2022, all the same. Not all the same. Mm -hmm. Not all the same actors, not all the same violence, um, and, and, and not, all, not, not all the same sort of um, uh, uh, you know, under the structures that, that lie behind it. Um, I, I think that you, um, you know, make that clear in the book, and I would say that you do more than simply, you know, reconstruct the crime. I mean, there um, in situating um, these lives, there's a tenderness in the narratives that you create of, um, you know, how people were living before they had the encounter that would end their life or propel them into flight. So um, I think that that's actually really important. And I mean, another aspect of that is thinking about people's connection to the land and what does it mean to be forced to leave the land you've been farming for three generations in your family. Um, I think it's important so that also the South isn't simply like the metonym of terror, right? Because people aren't thinking about the place where they have lived or their father or their grandfather or their great grandparents is that. Um, so you also convey um, that enormous loss. But speaking of discontinuity, I mean, I want you to say more um, about, uh, you know, maybe what's changed and what and what is distinct because I, I feel like you offer us a, a structural account of um, something that I might describe as the afterlife of slavery, but you offer us a structural account of a racial order that in, in many ways has kind of, you know, it's transformed, but it sustained, um, it sustained brutal aspects of itself over these transitions from slavery to Jim Crow. And I wanted to ask you that, um, like around policing for as a, as a case in point, because one of the things that you write is that when we think of the way in which the laws of slavery come to shape and inform the laws of you know the post-slavery period or the 20th century, that that continuity is greatest at the site of policing. And you know you have a chapter on you know patrollers, so you use this mm, language, yeah, which I is do. the language of mm. like policing and surveillance from slavery times to actually to talk about 20th century terror, 
and certainly in our own moment where you know police violence and state sanctioned killings are so um, you know so much in our minds how uh, how in writing that were you thinking about um, this moment of BLM and the kind of you know the global response to something like the murder of George Floyd or were you thinking like oh yes there are the structural continuities but it's a different moment it's a different moment, and, and let me just say, on the question of, of, you know, my book is about the South because much of the violence happened in the South, and also I'm making an argument from politics here that um, disfranchisement and the authoritarian regimes of the South made the violence, uh, uh, created the, the opportunities for violence that might not have been there uh, had people had political voice. Uh, and, um, but, you know, in order to fully understand early 20th century violence in our country, you have to read Sadia's book as well. Uh, not only, you know, understand violence, but um, uh, Wayward Lives talks about its quotidian nature, its, uh, its casual, um, uh, you know, nature, its consequences uh, for families um, and communities. And so yes, um, this is, I'm talking about a Southern phenomenon. It looks very different um, in the North, um, but, uh, and, it, it, and it has persisted over time. But uh, you know, I, I just think we really, uh, we, we, under have, we need to understand what it was like to know that if you fail to say, yes, sir, or you sat in the wrong seat of a bus, you could get killed. That's not true today. That is not true today. Could you get killed for things you ought not, smoking a cigarette on the street in New York, selling a cigarette on the street in New York City? Yes. You know, I'm not denying that. But I, I am saying that it is truly important uh, for us if we're fully to understand the moment in which these people live. And I think we have an obligation to understand their, their present. It's not our present. It's our past, but it was their present. And what did that look like for them? What did it feel like to wear a uniform in, this, in, in Durham, North Carolina, or Mobile, uh, Alabama, and to know that if you protested uh, the Jim Crow segregation on that bus, you could get killed, and people had gotten killed. Yeah. And so I, I just think it's, you know, it's, it's important to make those, make, notwithstand, and let me say one other thing, is which we have to understand, this is not inevitable, <laughs> you know? It's, it's not inevitable and it's not permanent, not necessarily permanent. And I, I, that's great, because at least- We could talk about that for hours. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, and particularly in that chapter on race transportation, because if there, um, you know, is a chapter where the elusiveness of democracy could not be any more, you know, radically stated is all of these, you know, um, black men in their service uniforms being murdered for minor transgressions, you know, um, not wanting to be late in returning to the base and being murdered because the bus driver doesn't like you know, the impertinence of wanting to arrive um, at the base on time. So I was gonna ask you, um, so you, again, you've documented all these cases, so it's like, that's democracy? Hell no, right? But you also want to leave open, you know, you wanna leave something open about possibility, and I wanted to, to ask you to say more about that, because the book is also about protest. And it's also about resistance. So there's one question about that. I don't know if you saw Jamel Bowie's article this week where he references your book. I did. Someone, yeah. Someone, somebody to, someone told me that he tweeted it, and I, I had to go figure out, okay, <laughs> where am I going to find this? <laughs> yeah. um, well, 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 I, well, what I, I like about that, which I think is really interesting, is that, I mean, he kind of raises this question about, like, oh, our fear of authoritarianism in the U.S., our fear about where we're headed, 
but just saying, oh, but some of us have actually been there. Absolutely. And Absolutely. So, so, yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely. And so, and here, I, and, and this, this is why I say voting is not everything, but it's something. Yeah. Right? Being able to elect or, or influence the election of your sheriff, of your uh, counselor, your city counselor, that it's really it made a huge difference. So you have you know the combination of uh, a a violence that is uh, you know ongoing and intense, be, uh, because it facilitates the disfranchisement of African Americans, and because African Americans are disfranchised, they can't affect the uh, conditions of uh, random, and casual, and everyday violence to which they and their children are exposed. So, you know, you have this mutually reinforcing phenomena um, that is all related to the franchise. And, and so... And the franchise is very pertinent now, as we know. Absolutely. <laughs> it's never, gar never guaranteed. But, w but w when, it's when, it, when it's not there at all, you kind of know it. And so, you know, I, I do um, sort of uh, in the chapter on the soldiers and buses... Uh, look at the uh, um, movement of uh, soldiers from many of them coming from the north into the south and having to adjust uh, to you know the, the, the white supremacy the white supremacy of the south and their natural protest uh, against that and uh, the chapter is really not just not just about them uh, and sort of the, what happens to them as individuals. But as well, it's about the failure of the, here again, the failure of the federal government, the failure of the War Department. So I tell this one story about a soldier in Durham, North Carolina, who protested uh, segregation on a bus in uniform. His name was Booker Spicely. He ends up dead on the street, shot by the um, bus driver. The uh, Army, the War Department, sends uh, investigators into Durham uh, in the wake of that murder not to figure out how the bus driver can be prosecuted, but rather to spy on the African-American communities in Durham and where this guy comes, Philadelphia, and where he's born, Blackstone, Virginia, to make sure that they are not organizing a resistance movement as against this killing. And so that takes me into, again, um, you know, resistance as well looks different we always, and you know, the book is really tells the story of you know, both the um, more um, formal forms of resistance, the protest march and the petition and that sort of thing, as well as um, the more uh, hidden uh, forms of resistance that, that one would have to discern from what's hidden in the archive. And, um, and so here on the buses, you know, we have the story of Booker Spicely, but we also have the story of women, African-American women, who ev virtually every day they rode the bus would figure out ways in which to fight back against their dehumanization. Yeah. And these are forms of resistance. And for those of us who are engaged in resistance, as we all should be today, right, it's relevant to know what um, these legacies mean for uh, our activities today. And do I have time for one more question? Yes, okay. And so um, so I just wanted, um, you know, to, uh, I hope someone from the audience asked about women in this book, um, because that's actually um, very important. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to ask you about repair, redress, and reparation, because, um, I mean, you, definitely think that, you know, oh, just because this has been the past, right, and, um, and it's not as if that past doesn't determine our present, but it's not absolutely determining. And so how do you get to repair, redress, reparations, and as, you know, a professor of law, as a judge, um, certainly you know better than I about the limits of the law, <laughs> about what it you know fails to do. So if you can just you know talk about that process of well, envisioning. Thank you for that. So, so the uh, <clears throat> the remedies that uh, we look at, those of us who 
um, interrogate the past and think about its consequences for us today, including what kinds of repair is appropriate, uh, sit outside formal law. And um, so we're talking about reparations uh, or, restore, or forms of restorative justice, uh, which don't take place in a courtroom. Um, they, these are political decisions, obviously guided by legal tools like co commensurability and um, the nature of the harm and that sort of thing. Uh, but they're not, uh, they're not tied to, they're not wedded to uh, legal definitions, either uh, constitutional or statutory definitions, uh, but rather they, um, they argue that politics demands, the politics of this situation demand repair. Let me just say, let me also say that um, human rights uh, law also calls for repair uh, of historical wrongs. And I argue here in our country, we're way behind uh, on this movement, which is global really, uh, to figure out what the, tool what the toolbox should look like uh, when we look back at, you know, the, um, uh, at, at colonialism, for example. Uh, and, or when we look at, um, you know, in uh, the indigenous communities across the Americas and think about uh, what they have endured over centuries. Um, so what is our duty? What is our obligation? And I argue here that these are large questions which we as a politic, as a community, as an American community, North American community, will debate uh, over the years to come. However, there is one group of, uh, of uh, survivors, right, uh, should be, would be beneficiaries of a reparations program. And that's the families that I identify and those like them in the book. These are people who lost their loved ones in the United States of America to an illegal system uh, and have never been, uh, and their losses have never been accounted for. They have never been compensated. The courtroom doors were closed to them, left, right, center, federal, local, local and state. Uh, and, uh, and, and we can identify them and we can measure their losses. So all of the broader arguments that circulate around the debate, the discourse around reparations, how far back do we want to go, who should pay, who should they pay, what is owed, all of those can continue and should continue. But I argue that this particular group, who have for so long been ignored, are entitled to redress. OK. So I think now there are questions that are going to be coming up. <laughs> OK. Oh, OK. So you're slow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, and actually, okay, I'll read them. Um, uh, can you cite any cases of relatives or descendants of the perpetrators of these crimes who have acknowledged and admitted to their family members um, their crimes or apologized for them or offered any kind of reparations do you anticipate or hope that more individuals will now come forward with apologies or offers of reparations as a direct result of your book's publication? Thank you so much for that question. So this morning I received an email from a high school professor, a high school teacher in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, who said to me, your book has made an enormous impression on me. He's a white high school teacher, uh, slaves in the family, uh, and uh, this is what I've done, but clearly we need to do more, uh, and to whom should I be in touch? And there is an organization called Coming to the Table, uh, which uh, follows on the book, the, the ball book, Slaves in the Family, right. uh, and involves f folks from really all over the country uh, who are on the, perpetra on the perpetrator side and thinking about uh, what, 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 what they need to do at this point. So. Uh, yes, there are. We ex I expect that the book will cause folks to see their family members there and um, think about what if what obligation that imposes on them so many years after the event. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a hard question. I mean, Ed Ball did write the book, what is it, The History of My Klansman, about his great-great-grandfather and the role in undoing Reconstruction, and he connected with, um, you know, those descendants Family. of black, yeah. you know, yeah. families who were affected by that violence. I think it's, you know, I think it's a hard work that people are asked to do, and I think people find that book challenging because it is about that accounting, right? Yeah. Um, so, okay. Well, I, I will also say while you're figuring out the next question, <laughs> that individuals need to do this, but it's th this is also a state project. Okay. This is not just an individual project. Right. This is a government, you know, it's a gov these are government policies, and it's a government responsibility as well. And I'm going to ask two questions. One is, um, what cu cultural structures and aesthetic practices aided in sustaining the racial order of the time and normalizing the violence? And a question about, did the community or individuals react or resist the violence? Did what? Uh, did Sorry. the community or individuals react or resist the violence? So those are two. Did communities? React to or resist the, the of violence? Of course, yes. okay, on yes. the resistance question. Yeah. question. The book is about resistance. Yes. The book, the, 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 the one, you know, there are three themes in the book. What's the nature of the violence? Uh, and as, uh, as Sadie had described it, quotidian and everyday and casual and routine and humdrum. What was the nature of the federal response? Uh, and as I said before, nada. Yeah. <laughs> and what was the nature, what, was, what were the forms uh, and, 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 and pathways and practices of resistance that affected uh, people, guided people in their everyday lives when they lived under a system where they knew uh, that for the slightest uh, mistake, uh, uh, misstep, they could die. What did they do together, individually and collectively, to resist? And so, buy the book, you'll find out. Yes, <laughs> many, many, many examples in the book. Um, this, oh right, yeah. Um, the cultural, um, what cultural structures and aesthetic practices aided in sustaining the racial order of the time? Cultural structures and aesthetic practices. Well, you know, this isn't, this is not what my, the book, this, there are many books about that, that's not my book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the queen here. <laughs> No, no, but, but, but you, I, can, you should answer that question. But, but I do really. think, um, I, I do think, um, you know, uh, there, I mean, what you do say, and I, I, I guess this is more to the social than to the cultural or the aesthetic, which is a really important point of the book, is that, you know, segregation as a structure is maintained by the nation, right? It is not geographically um, located in the South, that the, the apparatus of state and the federal government maintain it. So, but I think that there are, but I think that there is a kind of a cultural imaginary and aesthetic practices that make us think like, oh, it's only located in the South. And when that we fight think, against that, right? Exactly. Southern exceptionalism. But. Right. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's. Or there are quotidian practices, right? Like the whole notion of comportment. Yes. That's something, so one can have a, a kind of comportment as a black person that's considered impudent or uppity or just the, the very sight of black men in uniform, yes. right? Um, was enough to arouse a kind of um, animus. So that's a general answer to it. Um, what moral obligations does the state owe with these past harms? And how do descendants hold the state liable for the breach of these duties? It's a great question. And I think I've answered it in part by saying that at the end of the day, this is a state project. Um, state, not Alabama, state, United States of America. This, uh, and, and Alabama. So this is a project, a government project. These are government policies and it uh, ultimately falls uh, at the foot of government at the, uh, to, uh, to uh, identify and design a re restorative, reparative uh, uh, 
program uh, project um, that answers um, the arguments in not only in my book, but in so many books that have come out to, and, and, and described what, what life was like um, in these lawless times. Yeah, you have this great phrase. What is it? The lawlessness of the lawlessness of the law, but it's not that. It's something more. You um, where you if the law can't protect you from lynching, isn't lynching the law? Right, right. So there are all these kind of like formulations um, that are about the kind of the violence that's part and parcel. Yeah, the, of it, legal it, it eats into it. Be, you know, it, it, it's it's in the interstices of law. It transforms law and law. Everybody, there's some lawyers in here, so you know we've got, you know, we have uh, statutory law and then we have common law, and we, you know, and it, 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 this becomes a part, in effect, a part of the common law. It's the practice, and you know, pr law is is really. Practice writ, practice writ down essentially, mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah. So this becomes, but in, here we're talking about not just you know common law, but also it, the common laws uh, and the practice are and the norms are reinforcing the written law of Jim Crow in the South, and that's the difference between Philadelphia and um, and Atlanta. Uh, mm -hmm. in 1930 and 1940. And it's a big difference. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a meaningful difference. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and this is about how did you select a representative number of stories among the files? And, you know, how many, how many stories are in the database? And, that, and is that database something that we can now just go to oh, and search? Oh, thank you for that question. So the database, folks, there's... I introduced the database <laughs> part, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a day. So the, we put together a database of 1,000 cases, 1930 to 1954, crrjarchive.org, crrjarchive.org. Now available to the public, uh, it includes all of the documents that we have accumulated, organized, and digitized uh, that tell the story of 1,000 uh, killings that involved uh, racial, mo ra racial mo where, where we where there was a racial motive, and <clears throat> so the book draws on the database, but it also includes violence that was not lethal. Some of the earlier cases that I discussed in, in the rendition case, people escaped and survived uh, the violence, and as well the kidnapping, well, kidnapping I ca case I talk about. Um, but the, the book conceptualized, the, 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 the database are, the, the are raw documents, uh, and they're there for our scholars and, and family members to play around with and pursue and develop new, new projects. Uh, but they need explaining. They need context. They need theory. <laughs> they, you know, they, they need an expert eye, as it were. And I try to be that expert eye in the book. And um, this is not on the card, but I wanted you to say more about just women in the book. Because, um, <laughs> because I remember once mentioning casual to someone about a, a woman who was lynched, and they were like, oh, women were lynched? And so um, you also document a number of cases where um, women are subjected to just enormous and violence. I don't know if you want to talk about how you think about gender in this project. I, you know. yeah, so, yeah, so first of all, obviously, and just to state the obvious, the disproportionately large um, uh, percentage of the, of the, of the victims are, are, are men. Uh, there are women uh, who are also killed and uh, who we discuss in the book and are included in the archive. I start the book with the case of one Ollie Hunter, whose name was unknown to us until uh, we dug her up just a few years ago. Uh, who was a 60-odd-year-old 60, 60 woman in Donaldsonville, Georgia, 1940s, goes into a uh, store on Main Street in this very small town, picks up a can of oil, uh, annoys, for some reason, the young 20-year-old white storekeeper who follows her out of the store and beats her to death with an axe. 
Now, that's in my book, and I haven't heard from anybody in Donaldson yet, <laughs> but maybe we will. Uh, we don't know what happened to this young man. Uh, we suspect that he was promptly sent um, to the Army and then abroad, but we can't confirm that. There are no, none, no legal records in the town of Donaldsonville recording this death. The only document that, uh, that has survived that records the death of Ollie, Har of Ollie uh, Hunter is a letter written by a man to the NAACP who did not know her name. So it took to 1940 to 200, 2022 to give a name to a woman who dies in Jim Crow violence. And, well, women. <laughs> I start with her because, because it suggests, first of all, the, vulner, the, the vulnerability of African Americans, the unique and peculiar vulnerability. She's doing the thing women do, going shopping uh, uh, of uh, African American women, that they were as exposed. They obviously did not fall at the same numbers, but equally exposed as were as were um, African-American men. And I also talk about all uh, the, the, the women, as, as is true over the decades, form the backbone, both the floor, the ceiling, and the middle floors of the resistance in every imaginable way. And is there time for one more question or comment? Yes, okay. Um, and this is, a, awesome. you have a lovely phrase in the book where you're describing one case and you say um, it's, it's an unwritten page in the tome of fugitives. I love that line. So if you want to say more about, again, about the writing of this book in, re in relationship to those unwritten pages and, you know, and just the kind of the reparative labor of this book. I mean, you're very, you know, much, this is uh, a labor for the family. This is a labor so that these um, descendants who are deserving of reparations can ideally might get it as an outcome, you know, of the book. But it seems that there's something about, um, or maybe I just want to imagine that because I'm so committed to a certain kind of writerly labor. But so if you would just maybe answer this to think about your own labor in filling in um, the pages of that, the missing pages of the. Well, what I will say, I'm a little older than you. <coughs> just a little. And what I will say is that we're all responsible for uh, what happened in our generation. And this was my, now I want to speak personally for a moment, my parents' work, and it was incomplete. And when I discovered that it was incomplete, which was in 2007, when I learned about a lynching case that took place in 1964 in a county right next door to where I was working as a civil rights worker in Mississippi. And I didn't know about that case. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find out how many other cases there were that had not made it had not made it, and that's what started the work. And uh, you know, it was like peeling an onion. We just it, we just kept going. Twenty five? No, not twenty five. Fifty? No, not fifty. A thousand. Mm -hmm. And some of them, like Holly Holly Hunter, but for that letter, we'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. We will never know. So all we can do is our piece. And, uh, and we all have an obligation for our generation to carry, to carry the word forward. Well, that seems like a great place to conclude. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. <laughs>